My name is Evan Amato, and in this series, we're exploring how Dostoevsky's work and wisdom can guide us towards a deeper understanding of ourselves, our society, and our search for meaning. Today, I'm joined by my friend Elliot Honeycutt, and we're going to be discussing why read Dostoevsky. The dichotomy we chose for this video is collective versus individual. So, Elliot, why read Dostoevsky? Well, the Greek philosopher Epicurus said something that's always stood out to me when I think about the purpose of philosophy. He said that a good philosophy should do for our minds and our souls what medicine does for our bodies. And the moment that I started reading Dostoevsky, I saw that he had created a good philosophy. Hmm. What he had dedicated his life to was helping people to overcome all sorts of the existential dilemmas that we face in this modern world. He had also focused on helping his country to overcome the incredible division that had arose as a result of the Western ideals that had been rapidly, rapidly assimilated by the Russian culture. And so Dostoevsky shows us how healing can be accomplished on an individual level and also how it can be accomplished on a national or global level. And that's why his genius is so easily explained or simply explained in the breadth of his knowledge, his ability to capture individual truths and universal truths almost simultaneously, his incredible capacity for showing the effects that Psycholo that philosophies can have on our individual psychologies and how those effects can be perpetuated throughout a society hmm. with tremendous repercussions or tremendous benefit. So Dostoevsky helps people to overcome all sorts of doubts surrounding the biggest questions in life and helps them to find meaning and I believe that that's truly the most essential thing that any philosopher can offer. Excellent. Well, let's talk about how his philosophy has changed your psychology. You know, what are some of the personal hmm. uh, applications of Dostoevsky's thought in your life? So I began reading Dostoevsky only about a month ago, hmm. um, perhaps perhaps two months ago. And what happened when I first encountered him was. I realized that he was touching on truths that I was finding in my own experience. And as I started thinking back on my life, on all of the biggest decisions that I had made, all of the most intense dilemmas that I had faced, I realized that Dostoevsky was an author who had thought through those on a very profound level and who could offer me a tremendous amount of insight and guidance. So I'll be more specific with that. When I was in college, I struggled a lot with the idea of determinism. Hmm. I studied physics and I loved the idea that everything could be explained through physical laws. And I saw a tremendous power in the understanding of mathematics and science. I believed that if we could understand the way that the world was operating, we could predict not only what was optimal, but what would occur in every single situation. And despite the fact that initially this philosophy felt empowering, uh, this philosophy of determinism in the end led me to feel like I had very little control over my life, hmm. very little meaning. and a life devoid of meaning is a life devoid of direction. So I struggled with depression and anxiety and I lost my faith not only in God but in my fellow humans uh, because I started believing that they were simply operating as a result of natural laws. And Dostoevsky talks about this directly in Notes from the Underground. Notes from the Underground shows that actually 
when we put the intellect on a pedestal, no matter how much we develop it, no matter how much uh, consciousness we feel with regards to our own psychology and the inner workings of our minds and bodies, that we still um, will we'll have lives without meaning if we can't live for something outside of ourselves. And that's what we see in The Underground Man. We see a cautionary tale, something that shows us the darkness in order to expose the light. Hmm. And Dostoevsky was able to lead me in a direction of hope. Um, taking that out to the universal level, uh, Dostoevsky believed that a true change in our society wouldn't happen through protests on the streets, but it would happen through revolutions in the souls. Hmm. And so that's another way that his worldview has been so striking to me and so incredibly relevant. And so Dostoevsky is a writer who's certainly worth reading. It requires a tremendous amount of work to fully understand the context of his ideas, but when you do, it's well worth it. Yeah. yeah. And so I like that idea of the revolution in the souls, not on the streets. And that seems to go a little bit hand in hand with his philosophy of healing. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, exactly. So Dostoevsky lived an incredibly hard life. One of the things that attracted me to him initially was I, I saw a person with an indomitable spirit hmm. and such mental toughness. And I encountered uh, stories from a biography written by the scholar Joseph Frank on Dostoevsky that, that illustrated a, a compassionate heart that was combined with a truly profound faith and a nearly indestructible will. And so I saw so many stories that illustrated the power of challenge and difficulty. Uh, for example, uh, Dostoevsky, when he was in his 20s, was part of a socialist utopian circle known as the, the Petrushevsky Circle. And the Petrushevsky Circle, around the time that the Communist Manifesto came out, uh, were actually arrested and Dostoevsky was thrown in solitary confinement for nearly a year at one of the most intense prisons in all of Russia, the Peter and Paul prison. After that, he was... Named after Peter and Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. I guess there's a bit of irony there. Yeah. There's, there's always a bit of dark humor in Russian history. Yeah. So after that, he was sent to Siberia because it wasn't enough to be in Peter and Paul prison hmm. nearly a year in solitary confinement. Dang. He was sent to Siberia, and, and in Siberia, that was where we saw a complete revolution, a transformation. Hmm. First, the first revolution of the soul happened in Dostoevsky's own life. Dostoevsky, before this, believed that all people were rational. People were, were going to respond to their environment in a predictable manner. And that utopian socialists could construct a society that would work for those people. Uh, he wasn't wholly against the idea of, of social reform on a political level. He, he wanted a real revolution in that regard. Um, he most vehemently hated serfdom, and, and that was his main reason for being part of the socialist utopian circle. He believed in the equality of, of all men, uh, of all humans, and at the same time, he, he saw virtue in the Christian values that were espoused by these utopian socialists. But when Dostoevsky was sent to Siberia, all of his ideas about true social change came crumbling down. Because he realized that the, the peasants didn't trust the intelligentsia, the educated upper and middle class people. They didn't trust them because they knew that 
The intelligentsia were simply pursuing ideas for the sake of their own egos. They wanted to help the poor to lift themselves up, to make themselves feel more powerful. They were treating the poor with a spirit of, of love in a, well, of desire for their benefit in a sort of English utilitarian way, but at the same time, they had contempt for them. Hmm. Dostoevsky realized that that couldn't exist if true social change was going to take place. He saw that what was crucial for, for meaningful, lasting change in Russian society was a change on the level of the attitude, of the attitudes of the educated classes, uh, which would then change their beliefs, their convictions, their emotions, and finally, their behavior. But it wasn't enough to start with behavior. It wasn't enough to construct a perfect world. What, what was truly needed was empathy, and love, and understanding. And his works were rooted in that desire. Revolution of the souls, not on the streets. Love it.